Thank you. It was beautiful. Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but it's been a good morning for me. How about you, huh? It's a good place to be for the next hour and a half. Is that all right? <laughs> all right, I'll cut it back a little bit. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, uh, it, it sure looks different up here, doesn't it, with all the bicycles up here? What do you think? You all miss it? Do you? All right, great. I don't, actually. Um, I'm really, really glad I can ride my bikes at home now. I don't have to come here and then bring them back and bring, you know, all that. So it is, it is nice to have them around home. But I did enjoy the series. It's unfortunate, though, that just this last Friday, here I am concluding this series, and I just may have the best illustration, you know, especially with the, um, with the message on rules of the road. I, so I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to tell you this story. Um, so I'm riding my bike to, to church on Friday afternoon, late morning, early afternoon, and I was really going at a good clip, and all of a sudden, the lights go on behind me, and a cop pulls me over. No kidding. Seriously, I'm not, for going over the speed limit. Seriously. Okay, no, no, that's not true. I'd like to, I'd like to think that was true. That's, that's, that's not why, and I pretty much knew that was not the reason. Actually, I'm going to be really honest with you here. Um, well, here's what, what she said. The officer said, she said, um, sir, you know that on a bicycle, when you're on the road, you have to follow the rules of the road. I said, yes, ma'am. I, 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 I know that. I, I know that. She says, well, you must be in a hurry because you just blew through two stop signs. I said, yes, I know that. She said, are you familiar with this area? I said, yes, I am. And normally I ride on the sidewalk. And if I'm riding on the sidewalk, this would not be an issue. She said, that's right, but you weren't on the sidewalk. You were on the, on the street, uh, on the road, and so you got to follow those, those rules. And I said, yes, that's, that's true. And she says, now I understand, you were feeling it. She said that. <laughs> you were feeling it. I said, oh, yeah, I was breaking all kinds of records in my mind. And um, she said, so where are you from? I said, well, I'm coming from Leander. She says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Cedar Park. She says, where is Cedar Park? I said, well, good, good Shepherd Lutheran Church. I'm the senior pastor. And her eyes get... <laughs> Really? I said, yes. And, you know, it's interesting because we just completed a series called The Tour to Faith. And it was about cycling and tying that into the Word and, and all that. And um, one of the messages was called Rules of the Road. <laughs> and she laughed. <laughs> she said, oh, the irony. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, yes, it is, and you, you got me. I, I shouldn't have done that. And she says, look, I just want you to be safe. I'm just going to give you a verbal warning, uh, but give me your address and all the information. And um, so I, I just want to say, look, you know, I'd love to be able to stand before here and say, you know what, every time I preach, I practice what I preach. And here's the reality. The reason I preach so much about what I need to practice is because that's exactly what I need to do, to do is to learn to practice what I preach. And... Um, not always perfect with that, but I do promise this, I will never blow through a stop sign in that neighborhood again. <laughs> I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> they have my number. Um, so, you know, it feels good, though. It feels good, like confession, you know, and, and to just tell the, tell the truth. And I was, when I was thinking about this, I actually just thought about bringing this into my message this morning because, because I think it's relevant in tying the last series into this one, but also because when it, when it comes to, to truth... There are a lot of different ways I could have spun it. Oh, and believe me, I had all kinds of things I was going to say to justify what I did. But, um, but truth is truth. And, and so I just I wanted to share that with you. And also the timing of it is what really caused me to want to share that with you. Because um, this, there's been a couple weeks now where Vicar Stevens has been working on his SMP, Specific Ministry Pastoral Classes. And the particular class he's in right now is really uh, the studying of untruths from false prophets and false teachers down through the ages when it comes to the Word of God. And all different versions of how they take truth and they kind of spin it. Like I maybe could have spun the truth this morning to make it sound a little, um, well, less true. But these false teachers uh, regarding the, the Word of God, um, they go back to the beginning of time. I mean, I mean, they really do. You know, right from Satan in the garden to and I'm not even going to bore you with all the names of, of all the, the people that we've been learning about 
and relearning about, um, you know, some of the contemporary uh, counterparts of them, uh, people like David Koresh, you know, Jim Jones, Larry Wilson, Sun Young Moon, there's a, there's a whole lot of them. And, and the thing, when you study these false teachers and false prophets, you, you start realizing there's some commonalities. The commonalities are this. I, I find it threefold. First of all, every one of them has a secret knowledge or understanding of the Word of God. And they use that to appeal to you and to uh, get a hold of you. It's a control issue. And the second thing that's really common is they really put down the Christian church and say, well, you know, our few are correct, but we're the only ones who are. The Christian church has always been wrong and always will be wrong, and anybody who's educated in the church, the Christian church, uh, is just getting brainwashed. I call that projection. And then the, there's the idea of grace. And I don't know how many of you have had people knock on your doors and say, you know, I would like to talk to you about what we believe. And almost always they will say that they believe that we are saved by grace through faith, the biggest difference is their definition of faith is different. It's not faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's faith as obedience because that's what's needed to be saved. Those are the three things that are kind of in common. And, and, and what, I've, what I've realized over the years as a pastor especially is that these kind of false teachings and false prophets, they're not just out there in the world. They're sometimes they're right near and dear to us. And sometimes they're in our own house. And I take this, this very, very personal because my calling as a pastor is not just to teach and, and, and preach the truths that God gives us in his word, um, but it's also to protect you from what is false. And that's why I encourage you always, take notes. Take notes on what is spoken from up here. I would especially encourage you to do so today and throughout this series. Because you, you need to test it. You need to take what you hear from up here and compare it with what's in the Word. And when you have questions, that's when you pick up the phone and you call me and, and we talk, we meet, we get together, we discuss and, and, and see what you believe squares with what God says to you and what does not. That's how we get stronger and grow in, in our faith. But I'm telling you, I take this personal because I'm not only called to teach and preach it, but to protect you, to guard you by teaching you truth. And about 20 years ago, um, in our church in Southern California, we lost a member to a non-Christian church. And it was, it was heartbreaking. Um, and i uh, been praying for that person ever since, but it still tears at, at, at my heart. And so that's why, really, we put the series together that we did called I Believe. And this first message to kick this off is called, I Believe This Is Most Certainly True. As your pastor, I want you to know this. I care about you because God has placed you under my care. I don't care if you are an official member or you attend regularly. If you're sitting here, it's my responsibility to be faithful to God by being faithful to you in teaching what is correct in God's word. And so I do my best to do so. What's important, though, is that I want you to know what you believe and why you believe what you believe. That's what it comes down to. And that takes time, and that takes discipline um, to do that. In the early Christian church, this is what the Christians struggled with. I'd like you to think about this for a moment. When Jesus rose from that grave, it was a revolution. All of a sudden, you have these disciples who gave their lives to stick to that truth, that reality. They saw Jesus rise. Talk about a miracle. Talk about a defining moment in their lives. And that Christian church exploded. But as it started... It started really as a cult, as a novel uh, uh, ministry, as a novel religion, something new to the culture. And they had all kinds of, uh, of attacks on what they believed. And so what they did was they came up with ways to defend themselves. They used what are called creeds. Those are creedal statements. They are statements of faith. Like we just said a few moments ago, the Apostles' Creed. 
And I'm going to talk about those in just, in just a, a few moments, but there's three things I want you to know that not only why the early Christians used the creeds, but why we need to as well. First of all, use the creeds to defend yourself, to defend what you believe. The statements are all there in those creedal statements. Now, the primary audience of the early Christians was the Jews. And, of course, that's why in the creeds you're going to hear statements about Jesus and who he is. He's God. He's the Messiah. Also, the rule of law and what that meant to them. Obedience. Where does that fit in? Their secondary audience were Greeks, very smart, intellectual people, who believed in antiquity, okay? They were philosophers, and, and so they held on to what they called timeless truths, and you don't have it because you're new. And I, I'll never forget the time when I was talking to a lady and sharing with her what we believed as Christians. I didn't know at that time there were people out there that believed what she did, which was nothing, and she literally laughed at me, saying, how can you believe what you believe? You guys are new. How can you compete with all those religions that are thousands of years older than yours? And it didn't matter what I said about how what we believe is connected to the earliest of teachings, but you could see the struggle that the early Christians had, and we still do today. They also had to combat heresies, as we do today as well. Those are teachings that are in contradiction to what we know are Christian beliefs that come from the Word of God. And the two main teachings were Gnosticism, that is a secret knowledge as I just talked about, who is God and who is Jesus, I have something new to share with you, and also polytheism, many gods. Now, how many of you grew up liking some of the mythological movies that are out there, Sinbad movies, uh, Jason and the Argonauts, how many of you remember that one? All right. I loved those kinds of shows. You got the pantheon of gods up in the heavens and they're playing chess, you know, causing the fate of humanity. I loved it, but it was a fantasy to me. It was a fairy tale, not to everybody. There were a lot of people then in the Christian church and today even more who believe that to be true. So there are heresies like that. But the third reason why the early Christians used the creeds was for their own spiritual growth so that they could be strengthened in their faith. That's why they would say them, those statements, publicly and confess them over and over and over again. Because there's always a danger in getting caught up in what is not true. So some of you might be saying, well, look, isn't a doctrine, a teaching on the teachings of God in the Bible, isn't that more appropriate to use in a Bible study? Maybe so. Maybe so. But this is when I have the biggest audience online and also here. And I believe to guard and protect you, it is important that we cover what we believe very thoroughly in the next eight weeks, including today. Now, why? Because it's an issue of salvation. On what you believe and in whom you believe is an issue of salvation. And by the way, we are called to teach, and how can we teach if we don't first know? How can we disciple others if we aren't first discipled enough to know what we believe? In Deuteronomy 6, it's a very, very interesting passage because this was written at a time when the Jewish faith were holding on to the promise to come of a Messiah. But what they always focused on was the fact that there is just one God. Here, O Israel, it begins. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. And they said, teach that. Teach that to your kids, you parents. Teach that to your grandkids. Teach that to your friends and to your neighbors, those who don't yet know. But stay true to that. In Matthew 8, Jesus tells us what it means to make disciples. He says very clearly, you make disciples of all people by baptizing them and teaching them. Now what I find really interesting though is how he starts it out because he says, I have been given this authority to give to you. Go and make disciples, baptize, teach them, but baptize them how? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Did he use a plural? Do you say names of? No, name, nomos in the Greek, one single word. Again, going back to the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Just one God. 
So sometimes we think that the creedal statements are good for just then. There are many Christian churches today who don't even use the Apostle Creed or the Nicene Creed because they think that they're dated. Well, let me tell you why it's important we do use them today. I believe, I'm certain, that we are in the times right now when our faith is going to be tested more than ever before in our life. If we read right here in 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, it says, The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. That is the time we're in right now. It goes on to say, Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And boy, don't we want to have our ears scratched? We want to hear, we want, we want to hear things that actually convince us and, 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 and conform the Word of God to how we want to live our lives, to affirm what we believe, to affirm the sin in our lives. And that's why many churches today, many Christian churches, they're, they're fallen by the wayside in, in, in terms of listening to the politics of today, listening to the society of today, say, this is what's true now. This is what's true. It's like it's changed. No, it hasn't changed. This is the Word of God. And this is on what we need to base our understandings of God's will, God's law, what he teaches us in here. In Matthew 24, 24, it says, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will appear and they will attempt to deceive you. Now, Leona and I, for many years, we've, we've known and believed that. We've seen that happen with the kids. We have big heart for kids. We love to teach confirmation. It was kind of funny because on our way here from Southern California, I remember thinking to ourselves, well, you know what? We're just going to show up and we're not going to do confirmation. They already have confirmation teachers, so we're just going to, you know, we'll figure out where else God can use us in the church. We'd already been teaching confirmation for many years. And so we get here, though, and the very first Sunday was a communion Sunday. And we saw so many 16-year-olds coming up for communion and not receiving it. They were placing their hands across their chest. Because at that time, what this church did was they let people, the kids, go at their own pace as to how much doctrine they would learn and when they wanted to actually be confirmed into the church. Well, that's not the way we operated. So we took over confirmation and we said, no, we're going to give you a structure again. This is when you take it. This is when you learn it. Because you need to have it. You need to know what you believe and why you believe what you believe. The one thing I talk about here, probably more than anything else, is what I learned at the seminary from a professor, and that was the tube of faith. And that's the idea that when Jesus died on that cross and he earned forgiveness and eternal life for the world, the reason some are saved and others aren't is because the ones who are saved get connected through a tube of faith that's connected from the cross of Jesus to their hearts. They receive forgiveness and eternal life. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, what about the head? Well, we don't leave out the head. There's also the head. The head knowledge is important. But this isn't the, where the faith is. This is where our grip on our faith can become stronger because we get grounded in knowing more, having more knowledge about who God is. That's what confirmation does. That's what adult confirmation does. That's what Bible studies do. They ground us. They help us to hold on to the faith that God has given us so that nobody and no one can break it away from our hearts. And that's what false prophets and false teachings try to do. Now let me just talk about this, this, this primary formula that the Christian church used through creeds, through statements of faith. They take what's in here and they put it into very clear, concise, brief phrases. And then they put those phrases all together and they came up with statements of faith that the congregations could stand and together recite and they would recite them over and over and over again and not and and do it publicly but not as a witness to others as much as to themselves as we stand side by side and we say the creeds here the nice scene in the apostles creed as you just said a few moments ago you're saying i believe it's personal and god wants you to take it personal this is what i believe in standing right next to Stephen, right next to leona right next to, to john and donna they do too. And that's what God uses the community to strengthen us and to affirm in us that we got it right. Because I don't stand alone. But I have a community of believers who believe the same as I do. 
the purpose of this series, I want to make this real clear, this is not to draw distinctions between different Christian denominations, but rather to show that what is between Christian denominations is a common bond. Whether you're a Lutheran or a Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal or or non-denom, which is code for Southern Baptist, it doesn't matter what denomination you are if you are a Christian. There might be some differences in issues that are non-salvation based, but all Christian churches have a common belief as one in these following areas. Now, some of you have heard the word orthodoxy. Most of you kind of know what I'm talking about because you've been to the orthodontist. And the orthodontist means straight teeth. Orthodoxy, doxy is for praise, doxology. Orthodoxy is straight praise or straight teachings, correct teachings. It's not a phrase we use often today. In fact, if you Google it, nobody's going to know what you're talking about. I tried, believe me. But this concept is critical. It was critical to the development of beliefs by the early Christian church. And it had then everything to do with why we profess our faith today using the same creeds. Let me show you what I mean. There's something that's called the orbit of orthodoxy. Again, don't look it up. Nobody knows what you're talking about. But here are the items that are in that that all Christian church have in common. A Christian church believes that there's one God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but all of the same substance. It's called the Trinity, the triune, three in one God. No ifs, ands, or buts. That is the mark of a Christian church. The second thing is the incarnation. That is the belief that God himself, no matter how silly or crazy it sounds, God himself loves us so much he came down here as a human being in the flesh of Jesus Christ and did what we could not do for ourselves. He was obedient. He had two natures. He was both divine and human. Another thing that Christian churches have in common is there was something called the fall. Though Adam and Eve were created perfect, They were given the free will to say no to God, and they did. And they did. That's called the fall. They sinned. And from that moment in time, though there are different understandings in Christian denominations how that all works, the general idea is that's where sin started, and that's why we have it today. The next item under that orbit of orthodoxy is Christ's atonement. When Christ died on that cross, he died earned forgiveness for your sins. It was his obedience that gives that righteousness, that rightness in the presence of God. It is through Jesus Christ himself, and only he alone could do that for us. Another item under that orbit of orthodoxy is the authority of Scripture. And this is a troubling one for me because I understand the authority of Scripture to say this. This is what we call our formal principle. We get everything from here. This is the source. This is what we believe. Why? Because this is the Word of God. We call it the inspired and inerrant Word of God. And the reason I have trouble with this is because there are some churches today who call themselves Christians who do not believe that. They say, I'm sorry this isn't as relevant anymore because the world says differently. Don't buy it. This is where we get our teachings. It's what God says in here. And do not add to it. Do not take away from it. Do not twist it. God makes that very clear. There's judgment for doing so. Biblical morality is another one of the issues. It has to do with the Ten Commandments. Some people think, well, we don't have to be moral today. Um, moral relativism, don't buy that either. We are called by God to live according to his commands. We call the Ten Commandments, all right? Can we do it perfectly? I don't know anybody who has except Jesus. But that doesn't mean we don't strive to do so. Now, there are some accusations thrown at Christian churches. They say, well, they believe in cheap grace. They believe that that Jesus Christ abolished the moral law. No, we do not. He didn't abolish it. He fulfilled it. There's a difference. He fulfilled it for us. Now that means we're not saved by our obedience, but that doesn't mean that we don't strive to obey. If we are people of faith and in thankfulness and gratitude to God, we want to please God. And so he gives us the roadmap. He gives us the Christmas list to do so. He says, here's how. Love me and love people. Love God and love people. That's what he says. 
And the last one, but not the least, in fact, many people, especially in the Lutheran Christian denomination, say that our faith rises or falls on this one thing here. And it's the understanding of what is justification by grace through faith. Just about everybody come knocking at your door, we use that phrase. They do not mean the same thing. Because they change faith rather than believing in Jesus to obedience. No, we are justified. We are made right by the, right by the grace of God because he gifted us with faith in Jesus Christ. We'll be talking more about that kind of stuff as we go along. But I want to read for you a quote from somebody who was an atheist, then an agnostic, and then became a Christian, C.S. Lewis. He said, When all is said about the divisions of Christendom, there remains by God's mercy an enormous common ground, and it is. It's what we just went through, that orbit of orthodoxy. Now, the goal of why I shared all that with you is this to encourage you, to encourage you to study more so that you can defend your faith. It will prepare you to defend your faith, and it will equip you to be able to share what you believe with others, and that is our calling. Now, how many of you were here five years ago when we did the Explore God series? How many of you were here? Or maybe you weren't at this church, but you were at another church. The Explore God series was, was very, very interesting for us to do. The idea behind that was a, a Christian man financed Uh, this incredible billboard campaign to drive people to Christian churches. Didn't care the denomination, but he wanted to unite all of the Orthodox Christian churches. 300 got involved just in the Austin area. And the purpose was to share messages, the same message on each day from our own perspective. So while I was preaching about something, somebody else and the other of the 300 churches, they were preaching on the same topic, maybe a little bit differently, but not when it comes to what we just went over, those points that we have in common. I remember the first one being dealing with the question, is there really a God? Is there a God? That's an important one, especially the second question, then who is that God? The second one was, is the Bible reliable? And the third one was, is Jesus Christ God? Critical issue for salvation. Because is he God or is he less than God? Now, I got to tell you, when I was a a pastor in Southern California, something similar to this I, I experienced. We had a group of 100 pastors who got together, and the reason we got together was because we wanted to talk about how do we deal with the influx of non Christian churches that are coming into our community. A lot of cults were, were, were coming. I remember the very first meeting I went, was the only meeting I went to uh, and that was sponsored by the chamber and it had to do with interdenominational phase. I remember sitting next to a Satanist. And I remember the meeting was opened up by somebody who said, and we begin in the name of uh, God, whether it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or Master Architect of the Universe. And he went on and on and on with all the different gods uh, that he could come up with. And that's how, how that opened. Um, it was very interesting, and, and shortly after that, a hundred Christian pastors got together and said, how do we communicate as one, not changing our denominational identity, but how do we communicate as one that we're on the same page? Now, I was new to this, but I did raise my hand. I said, I think we should all use the Apostles' Creed, and there was grumbling because not every church, not every Christian church was using that, and some said, well, that dissent in the hell phrase and this phrase, I'm not quite sure and all that kind of stuff. I didn't come back to a meeting until the sixth week when we were they had gotten a small team together. The sixth week, they revealed what they had decided to use, though, and it was the Apostles' Creed. It was the Apostles' Creed, not surprising. So the question should be, from the time of, of Jesus Christ, how did we move from his teachings to the teachings we have today? How did we do that? Because Scripture has always been the source of our doctrines, of our beliefs. The challenge, though, is, is, see, Scripture doesn't have all of these beliefs in a formulated manner. In fact, that's why when people knock on your door, they say, do you believe in the Trinity? Well, how can you believe in that? It's not in the Bible. Go ahead and find it. And half of us go, oh, no, I must have been wrong. No, the word's not there. It's a Latin word. All right? It means three in one. That teaching is in the Bible, but not the Word. Apostles' Creed, oh no, I can't find it in the Bible. Well, guess what? It's not there, but the teaching is. The Nicene Creed, the same thing. And so it's not written in a way that that, that gives us those formulated, concise statements. But the teachings are here. You see, the church, 
I believe, since its inception, has only made it clear as it developed, as it grew, and it grew fast, to write down what they believed and always had believed, what they confessed and always had confessed as true. The church is not in the business of making up new doctrines. The church doesn't say, well, we've changed our mind because our society has changed. No, it doesn't work that way. What was given to the apostles, what was written in scriptures and confessed in the church since the beginning of time has now been put in the creeds. The three creeds, the apostles' creed, as I've mentioned. And that's the one we're going to primarily be focusing on in this series. Now, some people believe that this particular creed that we say was written uh, by the 12 disciples on the evening of Pentecost because there's 12 sections to the creed. Very likely a legend, okay? Very likely a legend. But we're using that one because that's one of the most widely used Christian uh, um, statements in all of Christian worship, worship all over the world. And then there's the Nicene Creed. We use that every other week during communion Sundays at our um, early service. The Nicene Creed dates back to 325 AD. It was the product of a council of Christians who were battling the false teaching that Jesus isn't fully God. He's a God. He's a demigod. He's Hercules, kind of, like the son of Zeus, but he's not equal to the Father. Well, the problem with that is if he's not really God, then we're not really saved. The third creed is called the Athanasian Creed. Now, all these names, the Nicene Creed comes, it was done in the city of Nicaea. That's why it's called the Nicene Creed. Athanasian Creed, crazy name, try to spell it, you can't. Um, Bishop of, of Athanasius is the one who came up with this, believed to have come up with this. It is a detailed statement of the Trinity. And the reason those three creeds, they all emphasize the Trinity is because it's all about, it goes back to the great Shema in, in Deuteronomy 6, uh, beginning with verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God is one. That's called the great Shema in, in the Hebrew language. There is one God. And all three of those creeds are designed to emphasize that truth over and over and over again. I want to share with you just real briefly where we're going in this. We're going to be talking about some philosophies that were influential on religious development. Some of you who like philosophies like, like Socrates know that Socrates was big on education. Nothing wrong with that except when he says it's the cure for all evil. I think Jesus is, but Plato, the preexistence of souls, and the Neoplatonists, those who followed uh, on his heels, that's where the teaching of pantheism comes from. Some of you may have heard this before, where everything has God in it. It's like God, when he created stuff, he said, there's a tree, you know, there's a fish, <laughs> there's a rabbit, there's a rock, you know, God's in everything. That's where that comes from. Also, what comes from is reincarnation. That when we die, we're going to come back to something else. There's nothing in the Bible that speaks to that, but that's a philosophical idea. And also is, is this idea that if you meditate long enough, and you have the, the, the right tones, you know, um, you, can, you can release your soul to be with the God of the universe or to be one with the universe. Those are some of the philosophies that influence the development of the creeds. Also, some heresies. I talked about Gnosticism, secret knowledge. Um, there's also Montanism, which is one of my favorites. I studied a lot about the, um, the Montanism because I, I liked... Um, to, to go back as far as they could in history and see how things developed. Did you know that in 100 A.D., people were on rooftops just waiting for Jesus to come back? 100 A.D., all right? This was like, you know, 65 years after Jesus died. <laughs> and they're all, he's coming back, he's coming. Why? Because 100, well, it was, you know, uh, uh, mathematically a part of a thousand, you know. So, so the, this, they all came out, and they were enthusiastic about it. And he's coming back. He's coming back. And and they've made predictions since then. Well, out of that, I mean, look at all the predictions we have today that are wrong again and again and, and again. That's how far back that goes. My point is, there's nothing new. But there's also all kinds of people coming out saying, "Well, I don't get it. I don't understand how Jesus can be both God and man." And so then people say, well, then he's not. Some question the genuineness of his divine nature and some of his human nature. And then some, they take all of these heresies that are out there and they treat it like a smorgasbord and they pick and they choose and they come up with their own. And it gets crazier and crazier. 
And each one of these philosophies, each one of these beliefs, and each one of these heresies had to be dealt with to protect the most important teaching in the Bible. God. The God of the universe loves you so much. He made you. He created you. He planted you here on this earth for his purposes, to love him and to love people. That's why you're here. And God loved you so much and loved this world so much that he knew he had to come down here in the person of a human being. He came as Jesus Christ to do what we could not do, to keep his laws because that was the only way we would ever be able to be back in the presence of a holy God. Because Adam and Eve lost that. Ever since they sinned, they could never be with God face to face. And nor can we. Until that time when Jesus comes back and we are made completely pure, righteous, and holy in our resurrection. Jesus lived that perfect life and then died on that cross because he knew that only he could do that. That's why he went there, because he's God. And he knew that in his death that would appease God's need to pay the penalty for sin. The wages of sin is what? It's death. And so God himself in his humanity was able to die. You know, the word tells us that God is the one who killed the son. We'd like to blame somebody else, but that's the reality because that was his plan. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from that grave. And because he gifted you with faith, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, no matter how much or how little you believe about it, you have the promise of the resurrection for you and to be with your loved ones who've died in faith as well. That is quite the promise. But a promise we don't talk about that much that maybe we should more is this one. He made the promise to be present with you. That no matter what you're going through in this life, no matter what kind of trial or challenge, what kind of grief you're experiencing, what kind of illness you may have, and even in the midst of your most joyful events, God's promise is to be there is to be right by your side, and he is. And his work for us in this life, through his obedience, his death, his resurrection, and his presence, all of that is all we need, and that's what works for our salvation. And for that, we say, thank you, God. And we not only thank God, but throughout this series, I want us to thank God for the people the people in the early Christian church who had to do what I don't know if I could have done, (laughs) put up with what, man, all the attacks and the challenges they must have faced. But they knew they got it right because they saw with their own eyes that empty tomb and the risen Lord, and they knew that it had to be true. And they gave their lives for it. And you know what else? They took it personal. And I have to believe that the reason they did was because they had a lot of friends and family who they lost along the way. Maybe to other faiths, other false teachings and false prophets that were snatching them up away from this new religion. And they took it personal. And God wants you and me to do the same. That's why we put these banners up here like this. For you to write these down and to remember these. And when you have doubts about your purpose in life, you say, you know what? God created me. If you have any doubts about how much much God loves you, just go back to that statement. I know God loves me because I know what he's done for me. And if you ever have doubts that you've been good enough or believe strongly enough to be saved, God is the one who saves me. He saves you. That is why when we stand together, when we stand together, you and I can say with all the conviction in the world, I believe.
and knowing that not only you, but everybody around you believes it personally and takes it so. Next week, we're going to be looking at the Apostles' Creed, the very first section of that. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 